Welcome to what must be the ultimate collection of BMW M3s. Over the next five films, we're going to look at the zenith from every generation, from E30 all the way to F80. In the first film, we looked at this, the E30 Sport Evo. Now we're moving to the next generation and the E36 M3 GT. The standard E36 M3 arrived in 1992 with a 282 brake horsepower 3 litre straight six, but no homologation backstory. As such, the body was much closer to a standard E36, albeit with the first appearance of the now iconic Twin Spar M mirrors. Initially, this second generation M3 was only available in Europe, with America having to wait until 1994 to get their slightly detuned version, about the same time that Cabriolet and Saloon variants popped up in addition to the coupe. So here we are, 1994, and just four years after that Sport Evo, we're in an E36 M3 GT. Now this is a very rare car, just 356 of these were produced, all of them in left-hand drive. There were some right-hand drive GT cars, but they were what's known as, they had the GT Optic pack on it known as GT individuals, so they, they looked like this but they didn't have the engine modifications under the bonnet. This however is the real deal, so that means a compression ratio raised to 10.8 to 1, slightly revised intakes, 264 degree cams, a BMW Motorsport dual pickup oil pan, duocentric oil pumps and upgraded Vanos software, all leading to, well actually only a modest uplift in oomph to 295 brake horsepower at 7000 rpm and 238 pounds foot of torque at 3,900 RPM. Anyway, thanks to things like aluminium doors, the M3 GT is also around 30 kilos lighter than the standard M3, and despite a shorter final drive, it has a de-restricted top speed of 171 miles an hour. The McPherson strut and Z-axle suspension also got stiffer springs and shocks, and if you look under the bonnet, you'll see there's an M strut brace. Visually, the GT can be easily distinguished by its adjustable front and rear spoilers and the clear front indicator lenses. And there is something about the stance of the E36 GT that is really, really appealing. Of all the M3s we've got here, it arguably looks the most at home in a pit lane. Incidentally, the added downforce pressure exerted by that rear wing actually breaks the catch for the boot lid after a while. Inside, the GT gets plenty of optional extras as standard and is trimmed with Mexico green leather. The exterior paint might look the same, but it's actually British racing green. The doors and dash also have carbon fibre inserts. The 350 production GTs were actually produced in 1995, but six prototypes were produced at the end of 1994 for homologation purposes. And that word, homologation, is really the reason that we chose this as the ultimate example of the E36. Yes, there were slightly more powerful E36s when the engine grew to 3.2 litres, but this is the only homologation special, built to allow the E36 M3 to compete in the FIA GT and IMSA GT series. Given that it's only four years between this and the E30, or two really, because the E36 came in in 1992 and the Sport Evo was produced in 1990, it's a massive leap on just in, well, the sheer size of the car, to be honest. We've obviously got a straight six under the bonnet now, the S50 engine. We've still got a five-speed gearbox, but no dogleg this time, just a, a regular H pattern with fifth all the way up over there. In many ways this, this couldn't feel more different to the E30. The engine is, is glorious, it's a massive leap on really from that four cylinder. It, it's a proper BMW sound. The gear shift is the Napoli sort of gear shift that I associate with BMWs and of course all the ones after this would have flat paddles instead of a manual box so it's, it's nice to have one of the, the recognisable BMW knuckly shifts in here. That engine is really really good, it's probably the highlight of the package. Now the E36, it's probably fair to say it's the, the unloved child of the M3 family really in many respects and you can see why after the E30 which is all nimble and light with its 1200 kilo curb weight this does feel heavier and, and slower into the corners you dig a bit deeper and actually the handling balance isn't so far away from the E30. As I said, the E30 was almost all about the front end and this 
slightly different reasons, but it, you do seem to focus a lot on just getting that front end into corners. It's not, again, still so much about the rear. You want to balance the car into the corners, so you come into the chicane like this, and you almost feel like you just want to have, you're on the front and just have a little lift to kind of, just to get the front end tucked in through the corner. The biggest distraction is that the steering feels rather slow, and thanks to the power assistance, light after the E30. On the road, this can be even more frustrating because you don't have the ability to push as hard and load up the suspension as much as you can on track. The balance is actually really nice. You can start to get some of that E30 balance feeling through the corner, but you just have to look harder for it. So there we are, that's the E36. I like it more than I think I thought I would, but you can equally see why a lot of people pick this car and then went and made suspension modifications to them to make them into track toys, track cars. And it's something that the owners thought about doing with this as well, just a few suspension modifications, because you feel like there really is a really brilliant car, particularly with this engine underneath this, just fighting to get out. The E36 M3 would continue to be produced for another four years, and by the time the last one rolled off the line in 1999, over 70,000 had been built, more than four times as many as the E30 generation. But there was never a more focused E36 than the GT, and for all that it might suffer a little from comparisons with the rest of its overachieving family, with its manual box, naturally aspirated straight six, and purposeful looks, it is still a very attractive package, and a crucial part of the M3 story.